All right, let's get going. Our theme for the year is uh, renew. And um, we've spent the first couple of months doing a deep dive into Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so we broke it down this verse a lot of different ways. But this concept is more than just simply changing the way that we think, although that is an important part of it. One of the biblical definitions that we've talked about for the word renew is this. It's to renovate. And we spent a lot of time talking about how in order to renovate something, we first have to demo some things. And those of you that are at the work day yesterday, there's a lot of demolition going on before we renovate it and make it what it's supposed to be. Uh, there can be no renovation without first doing the hard work of demolition. Paul told the first century church in Corinth that they were to demo or to demolish the strongholds and anything else that sets itself up um, against the knowledge of Christ. I'm not going to review all of that material, uh, but now that we're moving into somewhat of a different topic, I don't want us to forget or lose sight of what we've been talking about. Renewing or renovating our thoughts applies to every area of our lives. We, uh, when we renew or renovate the way we think, when we demolish the strongholds, we will be transformed into who God wants us to be. We will not be conformed into the world's way of doing things. And remember, the Greek word for conform is schema, which is habitus, not a word that we use very often, but habitus refers to our way of being. It's who we are. So in other words, when we renovate the way we think, we will be transformed into a new way of being. And so when that happens, the I am statements in our lives begin to change. Instead of continuing to make bad decisions and justify them with, oh, this is just how I am. Right? My grandmother uh, did it this way, or my grandfather was that way, or my mother was this way, and my father was that way. This is just who I am. When we, when our way of being becomes, when we conform and when we begin to align with our heavenly father instead of our earthly fathers or ancestors, what happens? We see it in the second part of the verse, which we haven't spent any time really talking about. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. That's the benefit of conforming and coming into alignment with God's way of thinking. And maybe that seems like a strange way to introduce the third part of our new series that we're on as we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And hang on, I'm going to try to tie it all together. As I said in the front end of this, the Holy Spirit and renewing our mind are really two sides to the same coin. Right? If you're trying to renew your mind and just you know, change things you know, externally or whatever without the help of the Holy Spirit, we get over into the category of self-help. There's nothing wrong with self-help. We need to help ourselves and we need to do things but we can't do that at the, at the expense of the Holy Spirit. We need Him involved to help us make the changes that we, that we need to do. In order to know the will of God in any area, it takes a renovation of thought. Now again, I've spent the first two weeks of this series talking about who the Holy Spirit is. And the reason that I'm doing this is I want us to renew our minds I want us to have a renovation of thought regarding the Holy Spirit because there's so many misconceptions regarding who the Holy Spirit is. When someone says charismatic or Pentecostal, that conjures all kinds of things in people's minds. Oh, I have to dress a certain way. My hair has to be a certain length. The Holy Spirit will make me lose my mind. He'll make me run around and flop around. Or some people have great fear when you begin to talk about the Holy Spirit. And so I'm trying to contrast some of these misconceptions with what Jesus actually says about who the Holy Spirit is in Scripture. These are the words that he used. We spent the last two weeks talking about this. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. He's our helper, our counselor, our advocate, our attorney, our intercessor. He's praying for you and me. He's our teacher, our peace. He's our guide, our truth, our friend, our confidant. How many of you are glad that the Holy Spirit is on our side? He's inviting us into relationship with him. Nothing to be afraid of. So my goal through this series is to dispel some of these misconceptions and to allow us to let our guard down a little bit. 
You see, some people have a wall that immediately goes up when you begin to talk about the Holy Spirit or things that are supernatural or Pentecost. There are also people who have been wounded by the Pentecostal church. I mean, there's all kind of craziness, documentaries and things going on right now. And people have been hurt and wounded. So it causes people to be like, you know what, I don't, if that's what the Holy Spirit is, I'm not really interested in that. But it's not who he is. And that's what the point of this series is. I want us to understand that a true relationship with the Holy Spirit is something amazing and not something to fear. Remember this quote from Robert Morris. We said it the first two weeks and we'll probably continue to say it. It's in his book called The God I Never Knew. I would highly recommend it. It says, missing out on the gifts of the Spirit is unfortunate. However, missing out on his friendship is tragic. Why wouldn't we want a relationship with the Holy Spirit, our helper, our counselor, our comforter, our intercessor? Now, just as some who are some some in the room and some just in are apprehensive in general about or toward the subject of the Holy Spirit, we also have those who have been around this type of ministry their entire lives. Maybe you were baptized in the Holy Spirit at an early age. Maybe seeing the gifts of the Spirit operate was normal. For you, I mean, I grew in a church, up in a church where tongues and interpretation and words of knowledge and prophecy happened regularly. I didn't know anything else. In the 90s, actor and comedian Steve Martin was in a movie called Leap of Faith. Any of my old folk remember that movie? I vaguely remember some controversy about the movie. Steve Martin played a traveling evangelist where he went and set up a tent and And in order to prepare for the role, he went to Benny Hinn Crusades and other famous healing evangelist crusades just to kind of learn the part of what a healing evangelist would do. I didn't see the movie probably because my parents wouldn't allow me to. (laughs) But it was a comedy and it was and it definitely made fun of the charismatic movement to some degree. Here's the point of the story. I had a friend named Richie that I went to church with all my life. And he was a couple years older than me, but he had gone to see the movie with his friends. And all of his friends thought the movie was hilarious. And when I asked him if he thought it was funny, he said, in a non-joking way, not really. It just looked like a regular Sunday service. (laughs) And our church was not that extreme. I was like, this is craziness. But my point is, we were used to seeing these things happen on a regular basis. Now, again, I'm sure there's a lot of hyperbole extremes in that movie. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm trying to say that it was normal for us to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit moving. When you grow up a certain way, you conform to that certain way of doing things. Our way of being comes into alignment with that certain way, whether it's right, wrong or indifferent. See, in every denomination, not just Pentecostal or Charismatic, we pass down things that aren't necessarily even scriptural. We've talked about this the last two weeks. It's just the way that we do things. Some of it's a style or a preference. Some of it's based around the culture that, that, you, that you were brought up in or, or the place that you live, where you grew up. Some people like Southern Gospel, Bill and Gloria Gaither, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Other people love Black Gospel, Ty Tribet and Israel Houghton, Fred Hammond. Some like it loud and, you know, loud and boisterous preachers. Others like a more subdued speaker. Some like it when the organ gets cranked up and everyone's high-fiving their neighbor. Yeah, somebody high-five somebody. <clears throat> I wish I had that. You know what I mean? I watch those preachers like, man, I don't want to be like that. <laughs> Others would walk out if that was the environment. But these ways of doing ministry are not right versus wrong. They're not Pentecostal versus non-Pentecostal. These are simply a matter of personal preference. But listen to this. When personal preference takes priority over Scripture, we have a problem. Remember the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 7. He says, you have let go of the commands of God and you were holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. And then he drops to verse 13. He says, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. Let me give you another example. In a church, the church I grew up in, we had a, a, a plexiglass podium. Now you've seen one of those. You, you're familiar with that, right? It's just plexiglass, had the world on it and a dove, you know. And so that's all I'd known. My entire life, from five or six years old till in my 20s. And at some point, my parents had transitioned out of that church and they began to attend and help serve at a church plant. 
Now, I came home from a semester of Bible college, and I started attending there also. And when the church built, they were in a, a rental facility. When they built their own building, they got this pulpit, and it was massive. It was this giant, wooden, like four feet wide, 27 feet deep. It had its own snack shop and mini bar. You know what I mean? That's how we did communion. We're just like, here is there. I hated it because it looked so traditional. And I thought that they needed a non-traditional plexiglass podium. What happened? Is my non-tradition became its own tradition. And really what should have been categorized as a preference, unknowingly, I had begun to think that my way was not only the best way, it was the right way, and anything else was the wrong way. And that attitude is exactly what Jesus is talking about. That attitude nullifies the effectiveness of the Word of God and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit put me in check. Listen, churches have been known to actually split over such nonsense. Carpet color, pews versus chairs. Overhanging a video projector or televisions in the, in the sanctuary. And that feels like something that should have happened in the 70s and 80s. But listen, I was a part of a pastor's cohort just last year where 50 to 75 of us would get on this training call via Zoom. And then would break into small groups and discuss various issues that we were having. And when I got into my small group, I was ready to talk about, you know, building the church and systems and going to the next level. And as pastors begin to take their turn and go around and share what was going on in their life and that what they needed prayer with, they would say, listen, I need prayer because I'm having a fight with my board and my congregation over adding TVs to the sanctuary. Over not being able to sing new songs. I have to be in a hymn book. And I was like, is this real life? This is really what we're struggling with still? Is this the 21st century? Are people literally still fighting over technology and carpet color and pews? Again, what happens is, is personal preference takes priority over Scripture. And when that happens, we've moved into this territory that Jesus was talking about. We nullify the Word of God because we place more trust in our methods than we do in His words. If we nullify the word of God in our personal lives or in our churches, we will lose our way, and we will lose our power, and we will lose our effectiveness. So I asked this question a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's worth repeating. I wonder how many times that we have made the Holy Spirit irrelevant in our lives and in our churches because we continue to hand down fruitless traditions of men instead of studying for ourselves what Scripture says about the person of the Holy Spirit. So when I say we need a renovation of thought regarding the Holy Spirit, I'm speaking to those who are apprehensive. I'm saying that a friendship with the gifts and with the power or with the Holy Spirit, that's not something to fear. He desperately wants a relationship with us. He wants to be our helper, our guide, our advocate and our comforter. But I'm also speaking to those of us who grew up believing and seeing the gifts of the Holy Spirit move regularly. I don't know it all and neither do you. And I dare say we've gotten some things wrong. And by the grace of God, he's continued to move in spite of us, certainly not because of us. We can no longer continue to do things that we've always done just because that's the way they've always been done. Look, there's nothing wrong with handing down godly traditions to our kids and to those who follow us. In fact, it's scriptural to pass on and to to, to talk about the miracles and the great things that God has done. We're supposed to pass those things from generation to generation. But we can no longer depend on just traditions of men to get us where God wants us to go. It's time for us to go deeper, not only in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, but also in our knowledge of why we believe what we believe. The only way to do that is to go back to Scripture. Why do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Why do you believe that God still heals today? Why do you believe that God is good all of the time, even after tornadoes rip through and wildfires are burning parts of our country and people are losing their lives and everything that they have? Why do you believe that God is still good in the midst of that? Why do you believe that God is for you and not against you, even though you've lost loved ones to COVID in the last two years? And you prayed for them. And you plead, you pled the blood and you anointed things with the oil. Why do we say, God, you're still good, even in the midst of our pain? 
We have to come back to Scripture and get away from these fruitless traditions of men, accepting what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives, embracing a relationship with Him that will guide us through all of the turmoil that we're going to face. It's not a time for man be pan be Christian cliches. It's time for the church to rise up in the power, true power of the Holy Spirit and be who we're supposed to be and do what we're called to do, which is to make Jesus famous. Amen. Pastor Johnny already preached a sermon about that today. <laughs> Share the gospel. Make Jesus famous. The Holy Spirit is supposed to make much of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the one who draws people to Jesus. The gifts of the Spirit are to draw people to Jesus. But how can we do that if we don't even know what Scripture says about who He is? Amen. And if we aren't, if what we're doing isn't based on Scripture, then it will be irrelevant and ineffective. This is a call for us to return to Scripture. It's a call for us to learn what the Scripture says about the Holy Spirit and who He is. I want to read a few verses from the book of John. But first, just a little bit of backstory on who John is. John is the cousin of Jesus. And as we'll read, read about in just a moment, he was filled with the Holy Spirit before he was even born. While he was still in the room, the Holy Spirit filled him. His job, through the leading of the, and the power of the Holy Spirit, was to prepare the way for Jesus. So we read about that just briefly. We'll read two verses in Luke and then jump into John. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. It says, For he, talking about John, will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. See, Mary, the mother of Jesus, goes to visit Elizabeth, which is the mother of John. And then watch what happens when John meets Jesus for the first time, albeit both boys are still in the womb. This is verse 40, 41 of Luke chapter 1. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. See, even while in the, room, in the womb, when John got close to Jesus, the Holy Spirit in him knew what he was supposed to do. Now let's jump into, into the book of John. John chapter 1, verse 23. I'm going to skip around a little bit. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Verse 26, he says, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by and he said, look, the Lamb of God. What's he doing? He's making the way. He's pointing to Jesus. The Holy Spirit inside of him is saying, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. We already know that John was filled with the Holy Spirit. We read that in Luke. So it's the Holy Spirit inside of him that compels him to make much of Jesus. When the disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and he said, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he said, and you will see. And so they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. And it was about four in the afternoon. And John chapter three, let's move over a couple chapters. John chapter three, verse 26 it says, they came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone's going to him. John's response. He must become greater. I must become less. See, John's disciples left him and followed Jesus. John's followers left him to be baptized by Jesus. In today's culture, we would get very threatened by that. <laughs> Do you see the pattern? John wasn't trying to build a platform, so to speak. He had followers. People considered him a prophet. But the Holy Spirit inside of John pointed people to Jesus. The Holy Spirit inside of us should do the same. If our lives aren't pointing people to Jesus, then we need to reevaluate whether or not we're actually filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter if you speak in tongues. Have all the spiritual gifts. Paul said, said this about those things. Speak in tongues. Prophesy. If you, you can even have faith that moves mountains. But if our lives aren't full of love, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, then we're just making a bunch of noise. 
The Holy Spirit is a gift to us as believers. I already referenced this, but I don't understand everything there is to know about him. And I know it can be confusing at times. There's all kinds of internal church language and denominational language depending on how you grew up. And that's why I keep referencing how people grew up because we learned this dialect and these words to describe these different things. That's why we have to go back to Scripture to find out what Scripture says. Everyone has an opinion on what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you at salvation. Oh, well, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. No, well, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, you can be anointed by the Holy Spirit. That doesn't even open the discussion of the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, how can we begin to understand all that there is to know about God or His Spirit? Honestly speaking, I don't know all of the answers. But I'm thankful that we're in good company. In 1 Corinthians, Paul said, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Even Paul didn't understand it all. He said that they were stewards of the mysteries of God. But I do know this. If there's a deeper relationship to be had, and I believe that there is, I want to go deeper. And I want our church to have a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit corporately. Look, I don't, ex- you know, I, I don't want to say I don't want to expect. You know, we, we had a little bit of an extended time of worship today. We went longer probably than we normally would. You know, going all the way back to last year, we've been singing and declaring. We did a whole series on making room for God. We want to make room for Him. And if that means interrupting our flow, singing an additional song, we worked on two songs for 45 minutes today and then scratched them both. And that's why there were some, you know, hiccups in the middle of, I don't know, pray me didn't pick up on it, but we were like, there was a couple moments where we weren't sure, you know, A, who was driving the bus and B, where the bus was going. <laughs> You're like, mayday, mayday. <clears throat> But just, it just, there was just a flow, like we needed to change some things. So we're trying to be sensitive to what the Lord is saying. And in the midst of service, if we're adding a song and going longer, we're trying, we're trying to make room. What I'm saying is I want us to go deeper with our relationship with the Holy Spirit corporately. If that means we sing a little longer, then that's what we do. But there are, I, I, And I said last, last week, look, that can quickly become a tradition of men where we say, well, at our church, this is what happens. The Holy Spirit moves this way, we sing, and if He moves, we sing an extra song, and then we do this. There may be a moment where the Holy Spirit directs us, and we don't sing at all. What would that be like? I, I don't know. That's been my job all of my adult life is to lead worship. Normally, it's the other way around. We're like, oh, God moved. We didn't even preach. You think God doesn't want to deliver his word through a person? That's the most important thing we can do. It's the age-old debate of why we created a worship. Worship's more important than the word. Word's more important. It's this fight between pastors and worship leaders. It's ridiculous. We don't even know how to worship if we don't have the word of God. We get off in, you know, fruit and nut land. (laughs) We're like a box of cereal. Fruit Loops and grapefruits. <laughs> Grape nuts. I don't know. <laughs> How many of you identify with the Fruit Loop? A few of you. How many of you? Uh, okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I want you to have a more intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit individually. I want the Holy Spirit to be active in our daily lives. Again, it starts with us going back to Scripture and renewing our mind, renovating the way we think. Those that have walls up, let's tear those walls down and renovate and have a new concept of who the Holy Spirit is. Those that don't have walls and you're ready to just jump head first into the water, slow down. Maybe some of what we've learned has been traditions of men and not even scriptural. Are we willing to take those things, uproot them, shine the light of the Word of God on them and go... You know what? I missed it. And say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me for the moments where I missed it and allow me to do it the way that you want me to do it. If you got walls up, let's renovate the way you think. You think you know it all? Let's renovate the way you think. God's so much bigger than any any of us could ever comprehend. It starts with us going back to Scripture and allowing God's Word to shape or sometimes reshape our belief systems regarding the Holy Spirit. 
A couple more pages and notes where we're wrapping this up. John chapter 2, I'm going to read a pretty famous verse of Scripture. This was the first recorded miracle of Jesus. It's uh, the wedding in Cana. John chapter 2, verse 1, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been, had been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why aren't you involved me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Do whatever he tells you. I don't really know if there's missing dialogue. I don't know what happened in this situation, but he's like, why are you involving me? And she's like, do what he says. <laughs> Verse 6. Nearby stood six stones, six stone water jars, the kind that, that were used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside. And he said, look, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. Now, what does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? I shared this a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, but I just think this is so, such a powerful thing that I feel like the Lord was speaking to me. Water in Scripture is a representation of the Word of God. All right, In a letter that, in, that written to the Ephesian church, Paul talks about the washing of the water of the Word. The water is a, a washing agent. All right, So water can be a reference to the Word of God. Wine, as many of you know, is a representation of the Holy Spirit often in Scripture. Now notice the instructions of Jesus in verse 7. Fill the jars with water. Their response was to fill the jars to the brim. What came out of the jars was new wine. Notice the instructions. Fill with water. They fill them to the brim. Out comes new wine. It was so good that the master of the banquet called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, but saves the cheaper wine for later. But you've you saved the best for last. Listen, here's, here's the point. I think in a lot, a lot of people in charismatic Pentecostal circles, we've become intoxicated with the cheap version of the Holy Spirit. And I think it's because we've become so enamored with the gifts and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But I believe that as Christ followers, that if if we will begin to pour in the Word, He said pour in the water, water, representation of the Word. If we will begin to pour in the Word again, out of that will flow new wine. That's better than anything anybody has ever tasted before. A wine that's better, a wine that's fuller and richer. It will be an outpouring of the Spirit that's never been experienced. It will be a wine that's birthed from and rooted in the Word of God. And so it doesn't swing over into la-la land because it's, it's anchored in Scripture. And that Spirit will make much of Jesus. The Holy Spirit in people will draw people to Jesus. That Spirit will empower us to crucify our flesh and make Jesus famous. And to echo the words of John the Baptist and prophet Isaiah, we will become the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He must become greater. I must become less. Let me sum it up with these three things. One, get rid of fruitless traditions. Two, return to Scripture. And three, make much of Jesus. A Spirit-filled, Spirit-led life is one that's full of the Word and wonder. It's not either or, it's both and. And if you have people preaching that's got to be one or the other, get out quickly. This is not one or the other. It's both and all the time. A spirit-filled life, a spirit and truth. A couple of years ago, someone in in the inner circle of our church, they said to me, 
I'm not really ready for all this tongue stuff. It freaks me out. I'm just not ready for it. And fast forward a few years, I can look back and that same person came to me at one point and said, I realize that my next step in my walk with God is to begin to pursue a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So the question is, what is your next step? What's your next step? Is it to begin to tear down some old fruitless traditions? No matter what they are, whether it's like, oh, walls up, Holy Spirit's in, I'm out. Can't do that. Or is it, yeah, I want to jump in with both feet, dive in. But sometimes in our eagerness, we get sideways. You ever jumped in in the water and landed sideways or on your back or something? Something wonky? (laughs) Whose birthday was Adrian's birthday? One time we went down somewhere in Orlando. Sorry. (laughs) But we, we went somewhere in Orlando. I don't even know. It's like some water obstacle course thing. Yeah, it was wakeboarding, and they had this other, I don't know, this other thing where you run around on f- floaty things, and you jump off. You've seen it on TV, right? I don't know. We have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know what I'm talking about either. You know, it's like, it's like bounce houses, but on the water, right? So you're climbing up things, and you're jumping off in the water. So we were all, we were trying to make a cool video, and it was me and Adrian, one of his best friends, and Aubrey was up there, and we all jumped, and, you know, it was probably me, fat dad. I was just like... <laughs> So we all jumped, and I probably, you know, I kind of dislodged her footing, I guess. I'll take the blame. I'm sorry. I almost killed you. <laughs> we, all, <laughs> we all jump in the water, and then we, she comes up crying, and then we saw in the video later, we're like slow mo it, but she went in like completely, just all the way sideways, just smacked the water. Anyway, the point I'm saying is... <laughs> The point is, a lot of us are, that's what we're doing. We're jumping off. But in our eagerness to jump in, we're losing sight of what Scripture says, and we end up in sideways. And again, thankfully, you know, I'm thankful for the grace of God that says, well, you're still in the water. There's a better way. But what's your next step? Is it to tear down those walls of thinking that you know exactly how the Holy Spirit's supposed to move? Is it to tear down the walls of fear and apprehension and anxiety? Look, I don't know what the answer is 100%, but I do know that He's calling us to go to a deeper place. And He wants us to take off our reservations and trust Him fully. Trust Him completely. To run to Him and say, whatever it is that you want from me, I want it. And to chase Him. Would you bow your heads just for a moment? On behalf of Pastor Randy and the entire staff at Everyday Church, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. For more information on the church, please visit us at everydaychurch.xyz.